How are you, man? I'm Gil Roth, and you're listening to a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. This is a COVID check-in episode where I record with a past guest of the Virtual Memory Show to find out how they're holding up during the pandemic. As far as how I'm doing, that's somewhat conflicted, which I'll fill you in on now. Sorry for the long intro, but that's how these things go sometimes. I had a great weekend. Um, I got in four podcast sessions, including this one. Would have been five, but a guest had an equipment failure. We're going to try and reconnect during the week. I ran a half marathon on Sunday morning, which was fantastic. I um, I plotted out a route to this this dam about seven miles from my house, overlooking all these, these woods and... and everything. And I drove it on Friday to figure out the topography and was kind of gratified to find that if I did a loop rather than an out and back, I'd knock out the last major hill by mile eight. And that would leave just five plus miles of mainly flat and downhill routes. Um, so that's how I kicked off Sunday morning, uh, heading out 6.30 a.m. and getting home around two hours later. Um, I did fine. i uh, was about 30 seconds a mile slower than the half marathon I ran last September, but um, that half marathon did not include any of the monster-ass hills I had to climb on this one. I also got to have a really nice, long conversation with an old friend uh, on Sunday afternoon, which I really needed. Um, as great as these check-in podcasts are, and, and as good as it is to, to catch up with people I've I've recorded with over the years... It felt really good just to catch up and talk a little differently with someone. Um, and to do that, not sitting at my work desk, making sure the recording is going and uh, that my headphone levels were okay and all that stuff. It was nice to, to remind myself that some, some things are ephemeral, you know, like the conversation we had. I recounted some of it for my wife. I'll remember some. My pal will remember some, but it won't be here. It'll just be us. Now... When it comes to things that are ephemeral, apparently my dog's claws are part of that category. Uh, this morning, Bendico, the world's laziest greyhound, uh, decided he would get over his laziness and run up and down the hall like a maniac and play with his squeaky toys after I took him around the corner. Um, apparently, he was going hard enough that he tore out a claw on the rug in our bedroom. Um, so that's kind of an unpleasant start to the week. That was the mixed part of what I was getting at a few paragraphs ago. Um there's just a panting dog dripping blood all over the place in our bedroom. I, I cleaned and bandaged him up, and my wife took care of the rug and, and all that. But we're going to have to get him out to the vet since this is actually the second time during this whole situation that he's managed to tear out a claw. Last time it was when we left him for two hours to go on a walk by ourselves, came home and discovered that he, in all likelihood, had been running around like a goddamn maniac and um, tore a claw somewhere. At least this time it was contained to a, a small area of the house as opposed to filling our entire hallway. <sighs> anyway, we'll deal. Let's get to today's guest, because that's what you guys are all really here for. Uh, musician, producer, songwriter, hell, I'll say it, Broadway songwriter, Gary Clark is joining me this time around. Gary was in one of my favorite bands in the 80s, Danny Wilson, and then went on to a, a solo career and got into producing other acts. And lately... Well, he wrote songs for this wonderful movie a few years ago called Sing Street about a teenage band in Dublin in the 80s. And Gary's songs for that are these fantastic pastiches slash homages to or homage to various genres of 80s pop. It's just this joyful, wonderful soundtrack. And Gary continued collaborating with the writer of that film, John Carney, uh, to make a stage musical of Sing Street. And after a run in downtown New York City, it was supposed to debut on Broadway in mid-April. Obviously, the pandemic put those plans on hiatus. Um, the Sing Street website, which is singstreet.com, optimistically has tickets available starting in September, although... No one knows when Broadway is going to reopen. I'm keeping my fingers crossed because I can't wait to see it. Um, and I'm just really happy that Gary's got this this whole new form in his, his career. He's also at work writing music for the Emma Thompson-led musical of Nanny McPhee. We talk about both of those projects as well as the live stream performance of Sing Street Songs by its cast, uh, which 
they put together as a benefit for Broadway Cares. Um, anyway, if you want to know more about Gary's background and my long-ass history with his music, which began, I think, when I was 16 or so, I'm going to be 50 next year, uh, you can check out the full episode we did at the end of 2018. There'll be a link to that in the show notes for this one. As far as caveats go, not a lot. He's got good audio gear. Now, here's me and Gary. How are you dealing? How are things, and where are you uh, in general? You don't have to give an exact street address, but, you know. <laughs> um, well, I, I was um, in New York right up until the time when the the virus hit and they closed Broadway, and I was kind of having the time of my life. But I, um, I came home to Scotland, and um, I kind of immediately got really busy because we decided to do a, a Sing Street live um, live stream thing for charity and um, it, it was actually technically a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be so it kind of, that gave me plenty to think about and uh, to occupy my brain, which I think is a good thing I've also been trying to really um, kind of use routine in my life, which yeah. I, I'm, I'm not normally very routine, but I, I, in this um, pandemic and lockdown, I've, I've decided that it's, it's actually really helpful. And I actually do transcendental meditation. And one of the guys who's a teacher in Brighton has been doing uh, every morning at eight o'clock and every evening at six o'clock, he does group meditations. And that really helps me like be at a certain place at a certain time and sort of fit work and food and stuff around that. Yeah. I find that quite helpful. Yeah, routine building. Uh, I was, I've been talking about it on this show for for a little bit now. My mornings, doing this show daily has instead of being more stressful, actually helped me get into a rhythm and a routine where it comes to the mornings where in the past I would just kind of dick around. Now it's the coffee, then write in the journal, then do the intro to the show, then go run and then start the work day, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's, it's good having that sort of rhythm, especially when people are all talking about the days all blending together and, and kind of losing track of things. You do lose track of the days though. That's, for sure, isn't it? You just like, this week seems to have gone like a flash, and I'm like, it's Saturday. How did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> but I did listen yeah, my, to a couple of the podcasts, and it seems like that it was getting you down a bit. And are you feeling there a bit are times, better? There, there are ups and downs. Um, you know, since I started doing the Sundays off thing two weeks ago, that that's helped a little bit in terms of the building up and and all that. And yeah. there are just the instances where you get up some mornings, and it's all just too wearing i guess yeah. especially i'm i'm 25 miles from new york and it's still you know yeah. new jersey and new york are still the the disaster areas as of far course. as numbers go but yeah. um but tell me about tm when did you when did you get into that and, and uh probably i was thinking about it for a long time and probably about three years i went three years ago i think i went and learned and then i um have pre been pretty consistent with it but I find that um, when my routine goes out or if I'm in a new place or uh, just a different routine, I find it difficult. So that's been that's been something that's been really helpful, just with structure. You know? uh, but I find it just helps in general, just general feeling of balance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? That's what I've always heard. I've never tried it. And the idea that the... It's been, you know, uh, championed by like David Lynch and Howard Stern. That tells me that, you know, a broad range of people can, can benefit from, from something like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was actually David Lynch's book that first that I first read that made me go, hmm, that sounds really interesting. It, it, yeah. Uh, I, it was about. Coincidentally, it, I just saw that yesterday or the day before on, on Amazon. I, I noticed something about it and, and thought I would give it a look. So it's called Catching the Big Fish. And basically, yeah. it's about where you find inspiration. And but but it really is very much about TM as well. Uh, I, I I picked it up because I thought it was going to be interesting from the inspiration perspective, you know. Um, but it kind of ended up leading me on the TM path. So <laughs> now, as far as inspiration goes, um, now that the Sing Street uh, uh, live stream part was over, are you are you working? Are you writing? Are you what are you doing? I guess. Well, the. Sing Street um, Broadway musical 
originally my concept was that I, I wasn't going to get too involved in it. And then <laughs> we, I, when we did it downtown at the New York Theatre Workshop, um, we had some meetings after that and, and I had some opinions about it. And then the producers really asked me to, to get involved and I just found myself coming completely addicted to it. And it's kind of coincided with, as we talked about in the last interview that you and I did, about I've been working on for a couple of years now, Nanny McPhee, which yeah. is the, the, the music, the stage musical from the, the movie that Emma Thompson wrote and Emma's doing the book and the lyrics and um, I'm doing the music. And um, that kind of had to go, we were really going to make, this year very much about Nanny McPhee. And then I had to apologetically say, look, they've asked me to get involved in the Sing Street Broadway thing. But I, I think in the end for Nanny McPhee, it's going to be really helpful because I'm really going to learn about putting a show on, which which was, it really was unbelievably helpful. But now that we've got through the, um, the Sing Street li live cast, I'm basically full on digging into Nanny McPhee with this kind of new perspective so that's keeping me very busy and um and yeah busy is good right now as you know yes <laughs> yeah my my day job involves uh lobbying and representing guys who do manufacturing for drug companies right. so yeah the my, my days other people are like oh yeah i don't know what's going on i'm like yeah no i know a lot that's going on and i have to stay on top of it all the time so Good. so that, that at least keeps me occupied and and you know feeling like whatever we're doing is actually good uh, what, ultimately what, for, for people what are you hearing in that world because oh oh that's... it's well, it's it's a lot of unrealistic expectations about how fast you can develop a vaccine yeah, exactly. and how rapidly you can actually manufacture and then distribute mm. it and then build up immunity um, because yeah. it's not just a matter of people get injected and the next day they're perfectly immune to everything. Um, so there are uh, over-optimistic timelines that only because I've steeped in this space for 21 years. Yeah. I know when people say, oh, we're going to make 300 million doses by November. I'm like, you don't really know what you're talking about. And <laughs> I do. And either you don't know or you're lying. So I always have to figure out if, if people are just blowing smoke or if they really just don't know what they're talking about. It's usually the latter. But um, I think... yeah, I've been involved in that stuff. So yeah, it's it's interesting seeing that and just having one little area of expertise that actually matters at this point in the world. Yeah. So. No, I mean, I, I, I see a lot of um, over-optimistic timelines in music. Yeah. You know, there's people booking tours and stuff, and I'm thinking there's no way that people are going to be going back into theatres at that time. You know, It's going to take well, a long time to build up people's yeah. confidence. Um, and, you know, we have to see. That none of that's predictable because it depends no. on how this... Well, that's the same yeah, thing with, with business travel and trade shows. Like everything we had got canceled. They still have a bunch of events still scheduled for this fall, but I'm I'm convinced that's just insurance purposes. You can't cancel too early or you're stuck paying the bill. Yeah, of course. Um, but I've got pharma companies saying they don't expect business travel until fall of next year right. um, based on risk, liability, and everything else. They just don't want to put their employees at risk when mm. everything is still so undecided. So that's depressing as all get out. But my question is, through the process of getting pulled back into to Sing Street, what did you have to learn about musical theater? What what were things that you had no idea were, were part of that that role? Well, I, I, I learned, the, the things I learned mostly about or scheduling and routines and just the way that a show's run. But the biggest mm. thing I learned really is that, I, and, and this is true of Nanny McPhee, I've been kind of thinking, you know, I need all these people in place who've done this before to, to do this. And actually, once I got in the middle of it, I was like, no, you know what you're, you know, you know what this music should sound like, and you need to trust yourself. And I mean, I, I brought in um, a friend of mine who, again, comes from the pop rock world, a guy called Pete Gordino, and he's, he's been uh, Depeche Mode's MD for about 20 years, and but he's a great songwriter and just arranger and and all kinds of things. And I just, I wanted somebody that I knew that was, that came from my school, you know. And the thing about Sing Street, I mean, I don't know how many people out there know about it, but it, it's it's based on a true story of a young band 
a, a school band in Dublin in the 1980s. And one of the things that I was critical about the downtown version was that it was kind of unclear who was in the band in an effort to to be a mu musical theatre and have everybody singing and everybody playing and whatnot. It got very mushy about who's who's actually in this band, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. And I and I kind of really wanted to go back to this thing of what does it feel like to be that age and playing music for the first time and really what the movie c captured so beautifully. And um, and so I with Peter who I mentioned, we we took the guys who were in the school band into a rock and roll rehearsal room rather than a theatrical situation and um, routine them just the way we would routine any other band. And, and it really paid dividends because they all kind of started to bond, play better together. Um, their instincts got sharper. And, um, yeah, so we, really what I was doing was bringing a bit more rock and roll to musical theatre in a way, and and I was kind of unclear going forward in Nanny McPhee who I needed to do all these because there's a lot of titles and you know um, hierarchy in musical yeah. theatre. And, and I assume there's there's union issues tied to to who can do what and all that. Yeah, yeah, that that was the other things that I learned about union stuff. Yeah, that's quite fascinating because <laughs> so a lot of the guys in the band are multi instrumentalists, and I would just yeah. say, you know, hey, Gian, can you pick up the bass? <laughs> and was, yeah. so, you know, one of the stage yep. managers is like, hey, hey yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> that's like, <laughs> you know, he's hired to play, play guitar or whatever that is, you know. So um, yeah, yeah there, I had those technical things to get my head around and also just um the the way they um schedule uh rehearsal space is quite strange uh i i understand it now and i understand why it has to happen like that and it's because of call times so if you say to certain if you say like what well, at the, at the end of each day, we would plan what do we want to do the next day and we'd say, okay, so we'll start with two hours music rehearsal, say, before we go into whatever choreography or whatever. And then um, in that two hours, what are we going to cover, right? So we'd say, well, we've got to do this, these couple of bits of underscore. I want to tighten up that song and I think we need to work on vocals on this. Okay, so what order do you want to call the musicians? And then once you'd worked that out, if you, if you, I could be right in the middle of something, and the stage manager would say, you're moving into the next phase of rehearsal. And I'd say, but I'm right in the middle of this. And it's like, it doesn't matter because you've yeah, called these up. actors and they've got to come in. And so you, you had to get very attuned to that and very kind of, um, it's, it's in a way actually quite good for focus, but it didn't make sense to me at first. I was like, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm right in the middle of this thing, you know, so. Yeah, but that, that's um, funny. So it sounds like everything about this, both Pandemic and Sing Street, are about you building structure and routine that you didn't previously have. Is that uh, accurate? I think that's fair to say. I mean, I think uh, some of that actually is just that I've entered this world of musical theatre, and that's very different. Not that I didn't have routine, but it was a more self-imposed routine, which I'm kind yeah. of having to, to do quite strictly during this lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, largely it keeps sane, but also so that I can really, that I'm getting things done. Because I think it would be really easy just to go, oh, I'll, you know, I'll go and do something yeah. else or I'll, you know, yeah, I, I want to get I, out of the house. <laughs> I've, I've seen that sort of vibe where it's just the frustration level. Even when it's the people who don't normally go anywhere, who get told you can't go somewhere and then that turns into a mental block yeah. and you really just want to get out and do something because, you know, we're all restricted. What's the the disposition where you are in terms of, of quarantine, social isolation and all that? Oh, it's pretty strict just as it is everywhere else. Um, oh, not Florida, but go on. <laughs> no, not Florida. Yeah. Good point. Um, yeah. I mean, that that's actually something that takes, You've got to factor that into um, the, the fact that things like going to the market actually takes longer because you've got to queue outside the market. Um, you know, everybody's in masks and whatever it is, three metres apart and stuff. Um, 
but there's a lot less traffic on the on the road. It's, the the weather's been remarkably nice in Scotland for this time of year. It's been absolutely beautiful to look out your window at the <laughs> the sun shining every day. Quite ironic, but um, yeah, people are, people seem to be in general. I would say following the the rules, you know, mm-hmm. respecting them. And uh, as far as making music goes, things are are tied to Nanny McPhee, or are you sort of noodling around or helping with with other people's work? Um, Producing. No, I, I no, I I really want to get Nanny McPhee done now, and uh, there's probably you know it will it as the script changes, the number of songs change, but the at the moment I, I think I need about another four or five songs so i can really see the light at the end of the tunnel and but when i say need those they have to be written and they have to be recorded and um i do all of that here so and different style of music than you're used to although when i think about it especially bebop mop top very much had a musical Mm. vibe to it but how different is this the but that is really, really in. different from Sing Street, for instance. Sing Street, yeah. um, and and actually, that's part of the fun of it. It's it's much more of a fantasy piece. Obviously, it's kind of slightly gothic and fairy tale, and and I want to keep catchy pop songs as well. So it's um, it's a mixture of all of those things, and I think it's I, I, I honestly think it's really starting to sound great now. There's some great fun songs and there's a slightly dark fun element to it as well for want of a better <laughs> word um, slightly, slightly twisted at the moment I'm, it, I'm and this is very um, it's funny because the I knew that this would be problematic for the producers but we had written a song or we certainly had the lyric for a song about when the kids in Nanny McPhee are pretending to be fatally ill so that Nanny McPhee will let them stay in the stay in bed all day. <laughs> and uh, the song is called Plague, Ricketts, Scurvy and Spleen. And uh, <laughs> we had this lyric and I had like people dying in it and stuff, you know. And I, I, uh, I sure enough, I got a note from the, producer saying it, this is probably not the greatest idea to be <laughs> writing this right now. And it just coincided with it's the first song yeah. that I've got to finish the music for. So I kind of went back into the lyric with a kind of post-pandemic frame of mind. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually ended up funnier, to be honest, because I made the diseases much more ridiculous than, uh, you know, and nobody dies in it. So Yeah. <laughs> but I can could, I could imagine going with the the... Yeah, the the the, the weird Victorian uh, yeah, sort of disease. Yeah, exactly. You've know, got yeah, to laugh, yeah. don't you, Gil? You've got to laugh. Let's not. Well, that's that. uh, that's that's been a, a chunk of this is trying to figure out the. Uh, it's okay to to lighten up at various points. The one thing I, I do want to point out, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, there's a movie, The Tall Guy, which does involve oh, yeah. uh, Emma Thompson and a musical, except she's not in the, the musical itself. Have oh, you ever? Yeah, I saw it a long time ago. I forgot the about musical that. of The Elephant Man with elephant with an exclamation point. Yeah. Somewhere up in heaven, there's an angel with big ears. That's the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the big closing That's one. Good. If you can find that on video. Uh, it's got a wonderful Emma Thompson performance in it early in her career, but it's also got just over the top, silly uh, musical concept around jeff goldblum it's jeff goldblum that's elephant. right yeah god i've got to see that again i, I mean i saw oh. it when it came out but that's got to be what that's a 19 a early around the time meet danny wilson came out frankly oh. probably about 87 yeah. 88 mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, um a virtual danny wilson reunion along the same lines of the uh sing street live that's kind I'm, of I'm kidding. <laughs> ironic, isn't it? We're actually all trapped in the same town for a change but we actually can't do anything yeah <laughs> Um, yeah how difficult was it doing the the live stream like coordinating music vocal etc with well tell me how how difficult was it well they really wanted to be the kids wanted this and the uh i say the kids a lot of the actors are young so i call them kids um 
because I'm old. Um, and anyone the, younger than me, which is going on 50 now, is a kid, which <laughs> is starting to get embarrassing. But yeah. Yeah, well, I'm nearly 60 now. But anyway, the, um, the, the kids, um, they really wanted to do it as live as possible. And I knew when they mentioned it, when the producers mentioned it to me, that the, um, the slight uh, glitches in time from everybody's different laptops and stuff would be technically would make that impossible. Um, and they did a test run that I wasn't around for. And then they agreed with me that it was impossible. So I said, well, the only way we can get them to feel live and actually do it all at the same time so they can see one another at least is to have some kind of timekeeper for the songs. So I made up basically like click, a click track, like just a hi-hat keeping time and with, and my voice kind of counting them into sections. So I would go like chorus, two, three, four, or whatever, you know, yeah. and just, just here and there. And then when they started to play a song, they would hear my count in their headphones. And we had a, a guy um, remotely had control of their laptops and he could switch off everybody else's sound. So they could then go into their part, their performance. They could see everybody else, but uh, they could listen to other people if they wanted to, but it wasn't a good idea because it would throw them off. So we, we unbelievably it actually sounded really good. The technical bit for me at the end was when I was sent back all the files, those files because of the internet connections were all slightly yeah. out of time. And yeah. so I had to basically put them back into time. So I, I basically started with the drums and then I would just move the lead vocal until it's like, okay, that sounds like it's grooving with the drums. And then I would bring in the bass and do the same thing. And then, you know, and then eventually I was able to sit back and listen to it and go, actually that really works. <laughs> and, uh, and I got, we got a, just a great response to the, um, to the live stream. People, people loved it, you know? So, um, yeah, it was it was technically a pain, but kind of worthwhile doing. And we raised a lot of money for Broadway Cares and the Mayor's Fund, which are all uh, for first responders and stuff in the COVID crisis. And is it feasible for Sing Street to return once Broadway reopens? I just don't know, like, with with rentals and timelines and all that stuff, whether that's, that's a window that's still open. Yeah, well, the... The, it's obviously it's happened to everyone on Broadway, yeah. and so I don't know what's you know I'm not privy to what's going on behind the scenes in terms of what the what's going on with rentals and things. If they're letting those things, I, I just don't know. But what we yeah. do know is that we're lucky enough to kind of have producers who seem to just believe in it and still want to hang in there and are being very encouraging about us all getting back together when this is over with even though none of us know when that will be yeah yeah that's the that sense and it's the same thing talking to my pharma guys a that we're all in this together b no one is at an advantage right now no. No. like there, there's no other guy who oh i get to travel to all these no we're all pretty much as bound and as as everybody else so i mean actually the thing that the 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 smaller venues is what's really concerning me. Like my my two brothers, uh, my twin brother and Kit, who was in Danny Wilson with me, both run a place in Dundee called Clark's on Lindsay Street, which is a, a live music venue that holds about 200 people. And this is disastrous for them. Like, I, I don't know if they will be able to open again. You know, I mean, it's literally that disastrous. And um, the, I, I think... There's a whole ecosystem of musicians who play that kind of sized gig circuit that are, I don't, you know, I don't know well how that's going to get back up and running again. I pray it does soon enough. Yeah, but, you know. yeah it's, it's a whole world that it's the same thing, not the same thing, but, you know, restaurants and all these other, yeah. we'll say low margin sort of places where, you know, things are so day to day or so tenuous that my fear is everything's gone and everything turns into a Starbucks and a, a CVS pharmacy Absolutely. when, when they come back. And that's, 
that Death, I, basically. I agree. That's my biggest fear. And I, and I was beginning to see here at, at the place I lived, there's a kind of small village community. I mean, I'm just on the outskirts of the city of Dundee, but there's a place called Broughty Ferry, which is closer for me to walk for little stores and stuff. And that's, that has a lot of little artisan family run businesses and butchers and little uh, craft shops and stuff like that. And, and I was starting to be encouraged by how that side of things was growing here. And um, obviously that's all going to be hit really hard but with this thing. So. Now, how tough was it getting out of New York when, when all this hit? Uh, I don't know, I don't know it, how they in managed the middle of March, it. But, um, yeah, things went sideways here pretty fast. So It was super fast. I, um, I think it was... I could be one or two days out, but I think it was around the 18th of March was the first Oof. day that we went into the theater. And that was a tech day, but it was also kind of a music day because it was the first day we got to to work on sound. So we were hearing the musicians come through the, the big system in the theater for the first time. And it really was unbelievably thrilling, even though we knew there was dark stuff going on outside yeah. the door. And then the, um, there was a meeting called for four o'clock and everybody was pulled together. And that's when they said we didn't, that they didn't think that we were going to be going back to work, but we would certainly all have to leave today, um, mm -hmm. that day. And then I was at a few kind of crisis meetings and it became very clear that at what, you know, that Broadway was closing down. And I just said, there's no, this is, you know, I, I really need to get back to my family and stuff. So they managed to get me out that night. I just went back to my rented apartment, packed a, packed all my stuff and just went through a very quiet airport. And at that point, the streets of New York, you will have seen it, were, it just, it seemed to go in about two days, just seemed to become a ghost town. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, I noticed that first when I woke up one morning and looked down on the street and there was there was hardly anybody on the street. And, and that's the theatre district, so it's usually teeming with people, you know. And then I went for a walk and places that are usually full, cafes and restaurants and stuff, were, at, were completely empty. I think that was a Sunday, so I can't remember what day that was. But anyway, yeah, it was very strange and eerie. Yeah. Yeah, my, my friends who are still in the city, especially ones in Manhattan, yeah, they, they just describe like the Omega Man, that science fiction movie yeah. from the 70s where you're the last man on Earth. And it's just like, this is New York. And yet, you know, you get closer to Central Park and now there are people congregating again and all that. But uh, right? yeah, it's still just, you know, I, I, at one point I thought about driving in from New Jersey, mm. not to go anywhere, but just to just to drive around New York with nobody else there, mm -hmm. which I know sounds morbid or weird, but when you've been stuck in traffic as long as I have over <laughs> those years, it, it. this is a weird you know, joy to, to be had that way. But but mm -hmm. I decided to, to stay here in the woods instead and, and hide out. I um, had a few friends who have went out to stay in, um, stay in the, with, you know, in friends' houses and stuff out of um, yeah. the city and the kind of, feel guilty about it and i've been saying you, you can't i mean like that but because the, one of the biggest problems with new york and why new york has been hit so badly is there are so many people um vertically crammed into these buildings and then they come back down onto the same street and they're sharing the, the same small spaces together and so you're actually doing good for the whole thing by getting out of the city you know yeah, I, I was just recording with a, an architecture writer and, and historian uh, earlier this morning who does not want to theorize about the future of architecture, future of office space, et cetera, mm. but did point out that uh, this is the exact same behavior from the Middle Ages. You know, when you had a plague mm. in summertime, everybody bugged out. Anybody who could afford to bugged out of the city and, and moved out to the country. Mm. Um, so, yes, there are class and income inequality aspects to that that make us feel guilty now, but yeah, right. it's it's not something that's a new behavior for yeah. us. Now, yeah, is there um, music or anything that that gives you some sort of solace? Anything you find yourself listening to that maybe you hadn't been previously? 
I, I tell you what, it's been fascinating is I just bought a digital um, streamer thing. Mm -hmm. And so I can now in my, our living room kitchen is kind of open plan. And the time that I mainly listen to music is either in the studio, which is much more um, like when I want to examine a record or a production or something, you know, it's much more clinical. But when I sure. listen for pleasure, it tends to be when I'm cooking at night. And um, and so this digital player has made me go back to listening to radio a lot. Yeah. And years ago, I had a, a place in France, like a, a, a cottage. That when, when we lived in London, we had a cottage in France. And we used to drive there quite a lot. We'd go through the tunnel and and then drive down. And it was near Cahors, which is southwest France. And so it was a long drive, and we'd listen to a lot of French radio, and we discovered this French radio station called FIP, F-I-P. And it is the most eclectic radio station you have ever heard in your life. And I've started listening to it again. And last <laughs> night they played in... We, we we commented on it. It was so eclectic last night. They played a French chanson that I didn't know. Then they played the Smashing Pumpkins. Then they played Ella Fitzgerald. And then they played a classical piece <laughs> of music. It's unbelievable. So I've been just letting feet make my uh, decisions for me. <laughs> nice. I, I've got to look that up now. I, yeah, my wife... FIP. Yeah, she generally does WWOZ out of New Orleans. She's a Louisiana native. And, right. uh, you know, they'll, they'll always have good... New Orleans music, especially around Jazz Fest, they played like a two week block of of great past Jazz Fest performances. It is weird living in the future, right, where we can like just request this stuff and have it come out of a little cylinder in our, our kitchens. It really is very strange. Yeah. Now, do you have the Neil Young? Um, I don't want to say ambivalence, enmity towards the streaming audio quality, or is it one of those things you just sort of say, you know what? This is what you get, you know, at least the music's there. I've, I've just accepted it, really. I just don't think there's any way back from that kind of stuff. So fighting it is, um, you know. I, I, I mean, I've, I have do, I have been quite vocal about, and, you know, I've, I've been to the European Parliament and to Parliament here and stuff, and uh, really in terms of... Uh, fighting for the rights of particularly songwriters in the streaming um, mm -hmm. economy. Oh, sure. But, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a rabbit hole we can go down for three hours, yeah. which I won't drag <laughs> That'll you be down. our next, our next <laughs> conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so there's a lot to be fixed in streaming. But, but, but if you look at the positives, it's actually, I think, I mean, I actually think the, the biggest positive is, is the liberation from the need to have major record labels and major record labels you know I've worked with them for years and years and years and it's not all bad believe me but there is particularly in pop music there's a tendency to format everything and get it as close to possible as what's already on the radio and all that you know we all know that but but it is very very true and that the, the the fact that if you are smart about your streaming income and you own your rights and you own your recording rights, your master rights, and 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 you know you use the music blogs and stuff that are out there on the internet, you can actually do okay. And uh, a lot of bands are managing, to, or musicians are managing to have incredible careers without major labels. And what that does is actually, but well, actually. The interesting thing is that it's bands like Wolfpack and the people that are just doing stuff that's so unfashionable that they would never have been signed by a major label, but they're so good that people want it. And so that it's it's kind of a new freedom. And I think that I, I'm really excited to see what comes out of that because I think it's, that can't go back from that. It's going to go more and more in that direction. So, you know, it's kind of in, in, a, in a weird way democratizes it and puts it back into the hands of the creators again you know? 
I, I still have to thank you for turning me on to Heights last time we, we spoke. <laughs> They've, of course, now signed to a major label. <laughs> I know, but, but still, at the time, you were you I was know, coming en- up I with got a to enjoy, I got to enjoy their, uh, their independence for four singles and then uh, Warner signed. Boom. <laughs> yeah. It's understandable. It's still an ecosystem. Everybody's still got to make their, their decisions of like course, that. But, yeah. but trust me, I'll, I'll never go commercial because nobody would ever think to pay me to do this. But anyway, that's, that's neither <laughs> here nor there. But my, my last question, besides being back in the theater in, in New York on Broadway, is mm-hmm. there any other place you just want to go right now that, that you can't because of, of our limitations? Um, the only thing that's been interesting is my wife loves travel shows she watches a lot of travel shows Mm -hmm. and she's still into um watching these shows where people go to try and buy a house in france or in spain or whatever you know they're all from last year or whatever but um i'm looking at these things and i'm going wow this is already you can't do that anymore you know yeah and i'm not a person who kind of goes on holidays and just lies in the sunshine or lies by the pool i just don't i I go to cities and stuff i like my brain to be (laughs) stimulated but i've actually been looking at these things going wouldn't it just be nice just to be in the french countryside right now you know like we used to take for granted just you know and um so yeah travel i think travel is going to be um on my agenda when i get out of here Hmm. well i will look forward to Getting to see Sing Street, my my hope was um, it would be Sing Street and Moulin Rouge because another one of my past guests, David Bearwald, has a, a couple of songs in that one on Broadway. So I was going to get to pull the oh all my past pod guests and their Broadway musicals and and get to go you know. Our um, but, choreographer Sonia Taya did Moulin Rouge, and so yeah. I was actually supposed to be going to see it the week after. Obviously, we went home so i was really yeah. disappointed by the way if if it ever goes back on again you have to see the david burn show did you see oh, that i've heard that's wonderful no i haven't seen it i've i've oh, and my, my david Byrne is my not my white whale uh philip roth was my my white whale as far as pod guests go but yeah. david Byrne and i were on a flight from newark to toronto and i thought i'll wait till we get off before i pitch him for the podcast because I don't want him to be uncomfortable in the enclosed situation of a plane. Not thinking that, of course, the moment David Byrne gets off the plane, they grab him, spirit him away from normal people, oh. and I will never see him. And that, to me, is the – I will never hesitate again when well, I see someone who, who I want to get, I, <laughs> Yeah, I will walk right up to them. And I've done it since with, like, Lewis Black and Spike Lee and, and Graydon Carter and all these people. None Amazing. of them panned out. But at least, you know, I just have the – there's not going to be a second chance, Gil. Think about Good, David man. Byrne. Go so, for it. You know. But yeah, I'll have to, to catch that too and, and maybe get him on the show. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've heard Good luck with that. It, it's, yeah, there's just this whole, all these experiences, like you were saying, that we just, you know, didn't even know that we couldn't have mm. until they were taken away. So mm. on that downer of a note, um, I am. I, I will listen to more of your music now just to, to cheer myself up and, and the Sing Street <laughs> soundtrack and, and the, the live cast recording and all. So, mm-hmm. Gary, thanks for coming on. And I, uh, thanks, I hope Gail. we are. Stay safe and uh, look after yourself. And, you too. Uh, and I hope we get soon. together in New York sometime. We will. When it's safe. We will. Great to we talk will. to you. And that was Gary Clark. He doesn't have a website, which is fine. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Gary Clark Music, all one word, G-A-R-Y-C-L-A-R-K-M-U-S-I-C. You should check out SingStreet.com for more about that musical, which has links to media coverage of the previews, uh, stories about the live stream, videos of some of the songs, cast info, and, and more. Like I mentioned in the introduction, the tickets link starts with availabilities this September, but there's no word on when Broadway will be reopened. Um, I'm hoping it's sooner rather than later, but safer rather than uh, uh, dangerouser is is most important. Anyway, um, you should check out Gary's work over the years. Look up Meet Danny Wilson and Bebop Mop Top for his earliest albums. Um, if you go to his Wikipedia page, you'll find a lot of uh, the, the various records he's been involved in and some of the producing he's done in recent years. And go check out Sing Street, both the movie and the soundtrack. Um, 
They're just wonderful. He also did uh, music for the HBO series, no, Amazon Prime series, sorry, Modern Love, also with John Carney, the guy who wrote Sing Street. Um, that has Gary's new version of Kooks by Danny Wilson, uh, Kooks by David Bowie. Um, when he was with Danny Wilson, they also did a cover of Kooks that uh, is one of my all-time favorite songs. I like this one too, but, you know, it's just when you discover certain things, they resonate with you the most. And Anyway, Modern Love, Amazon Prime. Uh, John Carney wrote that, adapting it from New York Times series of, of articles. And it's got Gary's music and his music supervision. Anyway, we'll be back tomorrow with another COVID check-in. Uh, if you want to send me a little update to read on the air or have something you want to share with listeners, let me know and we'll set something up. I'm at groth18, G-R-O-T-H-1-8, at gmail.com. You can find my contact info at our sites, vmspod.com and chimeraobscura.com slash vm. While you're there, you can also find a link to the COVID-19 sessions, which has all of these daily episodes. And of course, you can subscribe to the virtual memory show via iTunes, Spotify, or your podcatcher of choice. And that'll get you access to every episode I've posted, uh, including the 370 or so in-person ones that preceded the pandemic. Now, in the before time, uh, like I say, I always recorded in person. Nowadays, I use Zencaster.com so I can do these remote sessions. If you're interested in learning more about it, it is spelled Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, so no final E. The pro level of Zencaster is 20 bucks a month, but there's a free hobby level. I use pro, but my Patreon supporters more than cover the cost of doing the show, especially since I'm not spending any money anymore on uh, parking, tolls, subway trips, etc. for all the in-person sessions. I'm also saving a lot of time. I talk about that with one of this weekend's guests, just about the offsetting of, of not getting to see people in person, but not making my wife a podcast widow on weekends because I spend all my goddamn time driving in and out of New York. Anyway... What I'm saying is, um, if you're looking to support this show, just send me a nice email. Don't give me money. Don't go to my Patreon. Do go to the Patreons, Kickstarters, GoFundMes, Indiegogos, Tip Jars, whatever, for the artists and writers you like. Show them some support right now because, in all likelihood, they really need it. If you don't want to support individuals and you'd rather support a cause, there are plenty of charities you can give to, including your local food bank. Uh, they are probably... Well, they are probably in need of support right now because there are a lot of people who uh, are depending on their services who'd never shown up for this sort of thing before. So what I'm saying is, um, if you're in a position to help someone, help them. I am Gil Roth. It is Monday, May 18th, 2020, and this was a bonus episode of my Virtual Memory Show podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Keep the conversation going, stay safe, and wash your damn hands.